Good afternoon and welcome to today's webcast, How Tax Reform Impacts Long-Term Care Providers. Before we begin, I'm going to play a brief housekeeping video. Welcome and thanks for joining us. We're pleased to present another in our ongoing series of continuing professional education webcasts to help companies and individuals conquer challenges as they plan for what's next. Our presentation will start in a few moments. Before we begin, here are a few things to keep in mind. You can customize how you both view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can also adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons, each relating to a different aspect of our session. You can download the group attendance sheet and a PDF copy of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget to the right of the slide view. You can ask our presenter questions during the webcast by typing a question in the Q&A window below the slide view and clicking submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions during the presentation or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty during today's presentation, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Today's session will offer you one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the requirements as specified by the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of the polling questions, which we'll ask throughout today's presentation. To respond to a poll, click the button next to your answer. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon in the CPE progress widget to open a PDF file that you can save to your computer. Don't worry if you can't download your PDF certificate today. We'll email a copy to you in two weeks. If you're attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our attendance sheet to receive CPE credit. The attendance sheet is available in the slide deck and handouts widget. Please have all group members sign it and send only one sheet per group. Also note that CPE credit can be awarded only to participants registered as themselves and isn't available to participants who view the on-demand version. As a reminder, the presentation you're about to see isn't legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. And with that, Marcy, I'll turn the line over to you to get us started. All right, thank you, Emily. Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Marcy Boyd. I'm a partner in our Oregon region. For the past 20 years, I've focused on healthcare organizations and specialized in the long-term care industry. But today, I'm just going to be helping moderate the uh, webinar. So first, I would like to introduce our speakers. First, we have Rob Granham. Rob is currently the partner in charge of our EVER office. As the Washington Regional Lead for our healthcare practice, he also offers 20 years experience in tax and business advisory services to a variety of our clients, with particular emphasis on not-for-profit and tax-exempt health um, care organizations, in addition to for-profit organizations. Rob is also a frequent speaker and authors articles on the impacts of healthcare reform and trending tax issues. We also have Todd Wood today. Todd has practiced public accounting since 2012. He partners with companies in a variety of industries, including healthcare, to provide sol solutions for their business needs. While his experience is mainly focused in tax compliance and planning with corporations and flow-through entities, he also provides access to financial statement preparation and a variety of assurance and consulting services. Thank you, Rob and Todd. Okay, thank you, uh, Marcy, for the introduction. And thank you, everyone, for joining our webcast this morning. Oops. Our webcast this morning. Um, this is certainly a hot topic uh, for many folks around the country. And um, so our agenda that we're going to cover this morning is, uh, or this afternoon, I should say, is uh, we'll go over a little bit of a background and overview of the Tax Reform Act. We're going to touch on a number of the business provisions, mostly business provisions in this in this webinar. The the individual impacts of tax reform bill. We'll touch on a couple different pieces, but largely we'll not be diving into any of the details on on how the the bill impacts individuals. Uh, there are a number of tax um, provisions in here that impact tax exempt organizations, and I know we've got a number of tax exempt organizations on the line, and we'll be touching on those. 
And then finally, we will wrap up with some, um, some planning opportunities and some key takeaways for folks to consider. So with that, uh, just a quick background on, on the tax reform bill. Uh, as you know, it's, it's obviously law now. The House and Senate separately introduced, introduced their bills uh, in early November with uh, the conference uh, agreement uh, released on December 15th. Uh, House and Senate voted and passed it on December 20th. President Trump signed it into law on December 22nd. And, um, and here we are trying to, uh, trying to make sense of what all this law entails. Largely, from an overview standpoint, it is the largest, the most widespread change to the Internal Revenue Code in over, over 30 years. The last major change uh, of this magnitude was in 1986. Um, most of the provisions go into effect after uh, December 31, 2017. Uh, with a number of the provisions affecting, largely affecting individuals expiring after 2025, and that was that was largely a, a, a CBO budget issue, uh, with a projected increase of the de deficit of 1.5 trillion. Uh, some of these things had to have sunset provisions, and so with many of the individual uh, tax implications, they do expire uh, after, starting in 2026. Uh, what the bill also brought, and we're not going to jump into that uh, today in detail, but a lot of international tax implications, largely with regards to the repatriation of cash uh, into, um, into the U.S. from uh, foreign countries and instituting a new territorial tax system that became much more advantageous um, for U.S.-based companies. And so what we're seeing is that... Uh, that a lot of organizations are, as you might see in the news, starting to, to repatriate dollars and, um, and reinvest here in the U.S. I, there's a bullet point on here for simplification. Um, in some regards, there are simplifications to the code, but in all respects, uh, I think there's a lot, there's a lot of um, um, complications that, that came about with some of these provisions, as you'll see. Uh, there is no postcard tax return filing for individuals that uh, may have been um, as advertised uh, earlier last year, but there's a few items that are simpler with regards to 1040 filings, um, but for the most part, uh, it is, it is a, a little bit more of a complicated bill. Uh, again, the purpose was to ec spur economic growth. Uh, time will tell uh, to s whether that, that will be the case, but we are starting to see a lot of uh, large organizations pay out bonuses and reinvest, and as you read about CFO sentiment with regards to um, lower rates, uh, those are favorable. And then finally, there's uh, a little bit more parity on certain issues between large tax-exempt orgs and, and publicly traded for-profit corporations, largely with, with, with the, the tax rate coming down. Um, and, and largely, we're going to touch on a number of the tax-exempt provisions, and um, as you'll, you'll see, it, it largely was not incredibly favorable to tax-exempt organizations. Marcy, over to you. Thanks, Rob. That brings us to our very first polling question. As part of getting CPE for this webinar today, um, you'll, need a pay, you'll need to answer the polling questions. So the first question we have here is, could you please select the best sentence that describes your organization? This will give us a chance to get an understanding of the variety of organizations we have participating on the call today. Um, so the first one, you're a for-profit taxable entity. Uh, second, you're a tax-exempt entity that has significant for-profit joint ventures and partnerships. Or you're a tax-exempt entity that have some for-profit joint venture and partnerships. Or last, you're a tax exempt entity without any for-profit ventures. We will give the poll a little bit of time to um, let everyone answer the question. Depending upon your answer, obviously certain parts of the webinar will be more interesting to you for your particular organization um, than others. As Rob was mentioning before, there are um, several different parts of the bill that affect um, all of us. 
Okay. I think we have given it enough time to come to see what um, our answers are. So let's see. Okay. We have um, a lot of you on the on the call that are either for-profit organizations, and then a lot of you on the call that are tax exempt um, without any for-profit ventures. So I think we will be touching on a lot of information that will be helpful to um, to both. And I will turn it back to you, Rod and Todd. Great, thank you, Marcy. Okay. So we're going to jump right into uh, some of the more prominent business provisions in the bill. And here you'll see some of the, the, big, the big ticket items, if you will. Um, you know, the largest one is, as far as dollars are concerned, is lowering the corporate tax rate from 35% to 21%, and at the same time repealing corporate AMT. Um, you know, that, that's a big deal. That, that is um, what uh, many are hoping to drive economic growth and, and repatriate dollars and so forth. Um, but that's where you'll see a lot of movement. The second big item um, that we're going to spend a little bit more time in, um, in a bit is the new 20% deduction for qualifying pass-through income. And, and what that means is um, you know, most small businesses are not C corporations. The C corporations are, are what are the, the tax paying entities that are getting a, a, a rate benefit from 35 to 21. But all flow through organizations, whether you're an LLC or an S corporation or a sole proprietor, um, largely on the pass through, the pass through income is being taxed at your ordinary um, individual rates uh, on your 1040. And so this new pass through deduction, the aim is to provide a bit of parity between corporations. And, um, and flow through entities. The third um, big item on here is the limitation of NOLs and uh, what's called an excess business loss from pass through entities. Um, we'll touch on that in a bit. We'll also touch on the expanded access to simplified accounting methods. Essentially, Congress has kind of drawn a line in the sand a bit with regards to defining a small business threshold to be 25 million in revenues, and we'll, we'll touch on what that means. And then finally, for um, many of the for-profits, especially in this industry in the long-term care space, uh, the increased expensing for tangible property is, is much more favorable, and, uh, and we'll dive into some of those specifics as well. Again, this is just a, a summary of a few of the items, largely on the corporate level, uh, C-corporation level, that uh, the rate changing from 35 to 21 uh, to the extent that you are a fiscal year taxpayer, you'll, you'll experience a blended rate uh, between the splits in those years, those calendars. Uh, AMT, as I mentioned, um, has been repealed for corporations, and then there's a few changes to dividends received deductions uh, for corporations. The big change with regards to net operating losses, uh, generally, previously to the law, the law changed NOLs, um, if you incurred a net operating loss, you could carry it back uh, two years and forward 20, and there was no limitations to how much income you can offset. Now the rule is that NOLs are carried forward. Any NOLs generated after 1231.17 are carried forward ind indefinitely, uh, but limited to 80% of taxable income. So no more carrybacks. Uh, but the NOLs that you've got in place up through up to December 31st, 2017 will continue to carry forward. This has to do with uh, the, the uh, business interest deduction has to do with limiting the deduction of interest expense on, on debt of, that a business carries on its balance sheet. And so essentially what this is doing is limiting uh, the expense deduction every every year to 30% of what's what's considered adjustable taxable income. And, and adjusted taxable income is uh, basically your taxable income without regard to a number of items, which is bis business interest expense or income, your NOL deduction, the 20% pass through, and then up through uh, the year 2022, you can add back deductions for depreciation and amortization. Uh, but essentially, any interest, uh, interest expense that is limited because of this 30% threshold will carry forward indefinitely. You won't lose it, you just carry it forward. 
Now, businesses with gross receipts of uh, that threshold that I mentioned, $25 million in revenue, are exempt from this rule. So if your revenue is below $25 million, uh, there is no limitation on your business expense, business interest expense. And then to the extent that uh, you're in the real property trader business, um, and some in the, in the long-term care space as a, as a real estate owner might fall into this, uh, you can opt out of, of this uh, limitation but you would be required to use much slower recovery periods for tax depreciation, uh, what's called alternative depreciation system. So this will be, uh, this will be a provision that many for-profits are going to have to wrestle with in the years to come. Okay, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Todd to jump into some of the expensing provisions. Thanks, Rob. Depreciation and expensing of depreciable property is one of the more advantageous provisions that ended up in the new tax reform law. Many of you may be aware bonus depreciation in 2017 was at 50%, allowing you to take 50% of the cost of that property in the first year. And that was only for what was considered qualified property, which was new property, not necessarily new to the organization, but new as in it was the first time that the property had ever been used. Now, under the tax reform law, the bonus depreciation percentage was actually increased to 100% for qualified property. Going forward until 2027, and qualified property was expanded to include used property as well, as long as it was acquired in an arm's length transaction. So that's 100% bonus depreciation on property that was purchased after or placed in service after September 27, 2017, but before January 1, 2023. And the percentage of 100% will be phased out over four years until it is gone in 2027. The Section 179 deduction was a deduction that essentially allowed taxpayers who didn't put in service um, too, too much qualified property to write off 100% of the cost of the property in the first year. There were limitations to that. In 2017, the limit was $500,000 of expense as long as the qualified 179 property that was placed in service was just was below the $2 million threshold. Under the new tax reform law, those limitations have increased. So now the maximum 179 deduction in 2018 going forward is a million dollars, and that million dollars starts to get phased out if you put qualified property in service over $2.5 million. Now, additionally, the definition of property that qualifies for Section 179 was expanded to include qualified improvement property, which we'll define more on the next slide, but also certain non-residential real property improvements, such as roofs, heating and ventilation property, or fire alarm and security systems. Qualified improvement property existed prior to the tax reform, but it existed alongside several other categories of improvement property, qualified leasehold improvement, restaurant, and retail improvement property. Starting in 2018, those categories have all been summarized into one that is now known as qualified improvement property. Now, under the pre-reform law, qualified improvement property was 39-year property that was eligible for bonus depreciation. But under the new law that was signed, that actually has qualified improvement property as staying at 39 year, but not being eligible for bonus depreciation. And this seems to be uh, not exactly what was intended. As we look at the Senate and House versions of the law before the, they were signed, as well as conference and committee reports, it actually looks like they intended to have qualified improvement property be a 15 year property that was eligible for bonus depreciation, but that didn't actually make it into the law that was signed. There has been some attempt to pass corrective legislation, and 
we expect that that may come into play eventually. But as of right now, uh, any qualified improvement property placed into service in 2018 is not eligible for bonus, but is eligible for Section 179 expensing. Now, any qualified improvement property that's placed in service between September 27th of 2017 and December 31st of 2017 would still be eligible for bonus depreciation at 100% due to the overlap in the old and new laws. Now here's a summary of those property expensing provisions under the prior law and the current law that we just talked about for your reference in the future. Like-kind exchanges were limited under the new law to real property that's not held primarily for sale, except essentially just excluding any um, uh, personal property from those like-kind exchange provisions. Pass-through income or the qualified business income deduction is currently going by a couple different names depending on who you're talking to. Uh, but probably one of the most talked about provisions in the newest or in the new tax reform law, due to it being entirely brand new and also um, quite complicated. Um, but basically, the pass through income from qualifying businesses applies at the individual level. So once the income flows through to the the 1040 there is the potential to take a 20% deduction on any income that qualifies. Now, qualified business income is income, gain, or loss from a partnership, S corporation, or sole proprietorship. And it doesn't include compensation that's paid to shareholders and partners from those entities. It also has an exclusion for specified service trade or businesses. Um, so, for this audience, health services specifically would be excluded from qualifying from the qualified business income deduction unless they meet the ex exception um, which relates to the individual's income on their 1040. Hey Todd, I'm gonna I'm just gonna add a comment in here. Um, that because we're not covering individual implications in their form law. Uh, one item to note is that the individual, the top individual tax rate has reduced from 39.6% down to 37%, and so, which is favorable to individuals. And so what effectively this does is this 20% deduction, um, to the extent that you qualify for the entire 20%, uh, it, would it would bring your top effective rate down from 37% to 29%. You're not getting down to the 21% corporate rate, but it does it gets it much closer. So I just wanted to point that out. I don't think we have that on a slide. Also, just to emphasize, if you're a corporation that has investments in these flow-through type entities, um, this also will not apply. Everything will be taxed at the 21% corporate rate. So the exception for service-based businesses, if you have an have income below $315,000, you can actually still apply, um, still be eligible for the qualified business income deduction, but it's quickly phased out. Uh, once you hit income of $415,000, you will no longer be eligible for the deduction. So the deduction has a few different limitations uh, once you have determined that the business income is, is qualified, then you have to look at a few different limitations because that qualified business income deduction can be limited by 50% uh, of your W-2 wages and, or 25% of your W-2 wages and 2.5% of qualified property. So even, and we'll go look at a couple examples here in a second, but basically, um, even if all of your income qualifies for the qualified business income deduction, if you don't have enough wages or enough property in those investments, then you could be limited even further. And the other item to point out, I, I don't believe we have it on the slide. Sorry about that. 
the other item to, to note here is that you could have qualifying activities and non-qualifying activities within the same entity. So we would be, uh, you would essentially have to do an analysis within your, within your entity of, of what business activities qualify for this, this code section 199A um, deduction. So if you have a, a service type of activity within your entity that would disqualify you from the deduction, that doesn't mean that everything else you do within the entity would be disqualified as well. So here's a couple of quick examples looking at the um, the service business that has income beneath the threshold. You can see that even though their income is is between above 315,000 but below 415,000, they are getting a slight benefit from their flow through income. But I'm going to move on to a couple of the more in-depth examples. So it's important to understand that because the qualified business income deduction applies at the 1040 level, it also has a provision where it essentially nets the all of your qualified business income together. So in this example, you have three different activities, all with varying qualified business income, some with income and some with losses. Um, all of the limitations related to 50% of wages or the 25% of wages and the 2.5% of qualified property or just the 20% of qualified business income, those all apply at the activity level. And then once you've determined what your qualified business income deduction is, it then nets together uh, to give you your total, total qualified business income deduction. So in this case, you have three different activities. They're limited in a variety of different ways, but the, your QBI deduction on the far right nets to a total de deduction of 77500 Now, you can contrast that with example number three, basically showing that if you have a qualified business that ha actually has a loss instead of income, you can offset all of the QBI deduction coming through from your other activities to make it so you end up with no deduction at all. All this to say that, the, as mentioned before, the qualified business income provisions are um, complicated and they apply at the individual level, and so this is uh, something that taxpayers will be dealing with for the next several years. And Todd, I'll, I'll just add that uh, this is the one that we hear the most about from our clients, is how this is gonna work, and this is one of the ones that we're helping clients plan for the most, and it's the one that we need the most guidance from, from the IRS, and uh, we're, it's, it's been told that regulations are due sometime this summer. Uh, hopefully we'll get them by summer, late summer, but uh, at this point, uh, all we have is the, the root of the, of the tax code that was drafted by Congress uh, without a lot of interpretation yet from the IRS on how this uh, is, is really gonna work. Going back to a comment that Rob made earlier, just about the, these areas to consider, is what, actually is health services and in long-term care is kind of an interesting predicament because long-term care is essentially this combination of real estate, health care services, and food services. And so what we're actually uh, working with clients now to do is to bifurcate their business if you have these three all under one entity, there is potentially an opportunity to separate out those different service lines and calculate what the income is in each one. And the healthcare services could potentially be stripped out because it does not qualify, but the other two potentially qualifying uh, for the qualified business income deduction. So as Rob mentioned, we still need a lot of guidance from Treasury and the IRS on how this is going to work. But 
there is potential planning opportunity there, and there is limited guidance out there currently to help us plan uh, until we have further guidance from them. Moving on, there are new loss li limitation rules. Basically, before at the 1040 level for individuals, if you had losses flowing through to you from um, your partnerships or S corporations, you could take those losses as long as you had, um, as, as long as you weren't limited, and there's a variety of ways that that can happen. But now there is an additional limitation. You can only take losses up to $500,000 if you are married filing joint or 250000 if you have another filing status. Any losses in excess of that 500000 essentially become an NOL and fall under the new NOL rules, meaning they cannot be carried back and only carried forward. And when carried forward, you can only utilize 80% of that NOL um, in any given tax year. Now, a as I mentioned, there are a few different limitations. Uh, your losses can be limited if you do not have enough basis, if you're not at risk, in the entity or if they're passive. Um, and this limitation applies after all of those limitations have already been factored in. Talking about accounting methods, and Rob mentioned this a little in the beginning, but basically the small business definition has been expanded. It used to be gross receipts of 10 million or less uh, qualified to use a small business, and that's now $25 million or less. And what that has allowed is for many more businesses to potentially qualify for ca the cash method of accounting for tax purposes. They've also stripped out the requirement um, if that you're ineligible if you maintain inventory or to be subject to the UNICAP rules. And so this has allowed the potential for a lot of taxpayers who are in between that 10 million and 25 million mark to look at whether or not the cash basis of accounting would be beneficial for them to use on their tax returns going forward. And this would be a potential method change that they could apply for on their 2018 tax return. And this, this is just a great example of, of the simplification um, for, for taxpayers, making it a lot a lot easier to administrate um, uh, the tax code. With that, we turn it to Marcy for our second polling question. All right, guys, thank you. So far, I'm not seeing the simplification part. <laughs> um, so our next question is, which fringe benefits do you currently offer in your organization? Please select all of those that apply moving expense reimbursements, on-site cafeteria, on-site gym, parking or transportation benefits, um, use of any box seats at sporting events or concerts, or none of the above. And we'll give just a few more seconds for everyone to answer the polling question. Remember, the polling questions are part of the um, way that allows us to provide CPE to the people that participate. All right, let's see what we got here. So it looks like we have a lot of you um, providing moving expense reimbursements and parking and transportation benefits. I see that um, very common in my clients as well. Um, some that are providing some on-site gym and cafeteria, very little use of box seats, and uh, about a quarter of you that are doing none of those fringe benefits um, at all. So uh, Rob and Todd, let us know what the changes are related to fringe benefits. Okay, thanks, Marcy. So with that, that was the, the teaser into fringe benefits, which Unfortunately, this is one part of uh, the tax reform bill where there isn't a lot of favorable changes. These are mostly unfavorable changes. So one of them is entertainment or recreation expenses. Uh, prior to the reform law, 
those types of um, those types of expenses were deductible up to 50 percent uh, to the extent that it, it related directly to the the conduct of your trade or business that's been repealed so now starting in 18 there is no deduction allowed uh, for any kind of a, an entertainment or recreation expense related to the conduct of business. Um, so sporting event tickets and so forth uh, that are all business related uh, would not be deductible. Uh, meals are still 50% uh, deductible. There's no change with meals, but it's the entertainment component that uh, Congress wanted to repeal. Uh, with regards to food and beverage expenses for employees, so this would be kind of your on-site cafeteria. And the polling question mentioned actually showed a lot of folks on the call here that um, have mentioned they've got on-site cafeterias. And I, I want to make sure that this, is, this wouldn't be confused with on-site cafeteria for residents. This would be for employees. Uh, so in the past, on-site cafeterias for employees were 100% deductible. Uh, now it's it's 50% deductible, and then after 2025, it's completely non-deductible. So this is obviously meals on premises for the convenience of the employer. One of the big changes that's that's pretty unfavorable we see with a lot of our clients is moving expenses. In the past, moving expenses for the recruitment of an employee, for instance, uh, the reimbursement for such would be excluded from the employee's wages. Uh, and to the extent that the employee had any out-of-pocket on moving, they would be able to take a page one deduction on their tax return. With the reform, with the reform law, it essentially uh, it, it suspends that exclusion from wages and takes away the deduction. Um, so that's uh, that's an unfavorable change uh, for a lot of clients that we see with regards to recruitment of employees. Some additional uh, fringe benefit changes uh, in the law. Qualified transportation fringe benefits, so um, bus passes, um, ferry passes, any kind of a com commuting um, assistance that you're providing to your employees has always been excluded from employees' wages, still is excluded from employees' wages up to certain thresholds. However, the change now is that it's not deductible, uh, so that to the extent you're a for-profit, you can't take a deduction for, the, for that spend, which in a lot of circumstances turns out to be a lot of money. And one of the big unfavorable changes for tax exempt organizations is obviously you don't have you don't as, as a tax exempt you're not taking a deduction for this, but what what the rule calls for now is that it that it be considered unrelated business income, and therefore subject to subject to tax, um, and that both this this also applies does not apply if it's if the transportation is considered for the safety of the employee, but. So this is going to be a, a big one that a lot of people are going to have to, both on the for-profit and not-for-profit side, get their arms around. The same with the qualified parking facility. So to the extent that we par provide um, a parking garage or parking lot or uh, parking assistance for employees, it's excluded from wages, uh, but now it's not deductible. And if you're a tax-exempt organization, uh, it's going to be treated as, as unrelated business income. Um, in, in taxed as such. The same goes with on-premises athletic facilities. Again, it's excluded from wages, but now it's non-deductible and subject to UBIT uh, if you're a not-for-profit. So some unfavorable changes there. Uh, one favorable um, change is a, is a credit, a tax credit that's allowed, available um, for wages paid through 2019, 1231-2019. And that is it allows a business tax credit of up to 12.5% of wages to a qualifying employee um, who's on a family or medical leave. And so uh, some of the eligibility criteria is that you've got a written policy in place. It's not paid for, reimbursed by state or local government, um, and uh, that the eligible employee is not less than 60% of the threshold for highly compensated employees. So to the extent you've got programs where you're paying folks to be on leave for family or medical purposes, uh, there may be a credit opportunity available to you. Okay, I'm going to pass it over to Todd and deal with uh, a question that we received from a lot of clients. As Rob mentioned, a lot of clients 
understanding that the corporate tax rate has dropped to 21% are coming to us and asking, should we be a C-Corp? Um, most S-Corps or partnerships or anyone who's not already a corporation. Um, they are more attractive because of that lower tax rate, but there are some items to consider. Uh, likelihood of a large sales price on future sale of the company, especially if a large portion of that's related to goodwill is or uh, appreciation and assets is, is likely not a great scenario to have for a, a corporation. Also, what the earnings of the company are being used for. Are they used for reinvestment into the company and growth, or is it to maximize the wages or draws of the owners of the company? And also, um, with flow through entities, you know, the compensation plans and can be different and complex. So if you're a corporation and, and you're using wages to essentially wipe out your taxable income each year, um, then you're not necessarily benefiting from that 21% corporate tax rate, and is there you know, a, a potentially better structure to be in? It's also important to note that the qualified business income deduction only lasts until 2026. So we put in a, a couple examples in here. Basically, um, each, each company is going to be different depending on what their goals are. And it's important to do an analysis and not just make a blanket determination. Um, you should or should not be a corp. Uh, that doesn't wouldn't apply to everyone. And so what we're finding, though, is in most cases, if you are a flow-through entity, it doesn't necessarily make sense to switch to a corporation. And these, this example shows, you know, just, you know, a million dollars of taxable income, um, but no state tax, 21% uh, tax rate versus uh, one where you are qualifying for the qualified business income deduction of that 20%, even if you're not. That's the third example there on the right. Um, you can see at the end of the day, generally switching to a, a C-Corp uh, is you're going to end up paying a little bit more tax. Now, if you go to example number two, this has state tax in it as well at a 10% rate, and you can see that uh, the difference is, is about the same, if not a little bit wider. Um, and so we don't, we we highly encourage you if you're considering this to, to talk to your tax professionals and have them do some sort of analysis. Um, in the past, the corporate tax rate was you know, 35%, and so uh, the the difference was was pretty wide over you know whether one was better than the other. Now that we have the lower income tax rate on corporations and the qualified business income deduction for flow throughs, that's narrowed down. Um, but in in a lot of cases, it can still make sense to stick in a flow through structure. And and what I would add here, Todd, is that. What this example does, showing state income tax expense, is the law also on the individual side on your Schedule A itemized deductions. It limits the tax, the deduction for state taxes, income taxes, sales taxes, property taxes, everything, all into $10,000. And so, even the point of this example is, even though individuals, when the state income tax flows through to them in a flow-through manner. Uh, to their 1040, and you're getting limited to $10,000, um, uh, you still would be better off in a flow-through manner than in a C-Corp, and you're taking all the excess cash out via uh, a taxable dividend. Great point. With that, our third polling question, Marcy. Okay. So for our third polling question, uh, what tax law changes will have the Im biggest impact on your organization based upon what you've heard so far. Um, the increased tangible property expensing, the 20% pass-through deduction, the taxable fringe benefits, the 21% corporate tax rate, 
or some other component of the tax law provisions. Give it just a few more seconds to let everyone have a chance to answer the polling question. Okay, let's see what we got. So it looks like a lot of the um, a lot of the people on the call today think the taxable fringe benefits will have the biggest impact, followed by pretty evenly by the other um, areas. What's interesting is the increased tangible property expensing didn't get any answers. Um, so maybe I'll let Todd and uh, Rob speak to that a little bit. Okay, thank you, Marcy. Um, yeah, I was curious to see. I was expecting to see a little bit more uh, response on the, the expense per, um, expensing, but, uh, but I, I don't disagree with all the other answers either. Okay, we're going to touch on a few um, of the changes to tax-exempt uh, organizations. The first one being um, compensation, and this won't apply uh, all over the place, but it, it will apply in certain circumstances, and that is uh, what's considered a covered employee who's paid in excess of a million dollars uh, by the organization. That that amount over that threshold would be subject to a 21% excise tax uh, by the tax-exempt organization. Um, and this includes excise, excess parachute payments as well paid to these uncovered employees. So um, you might, might see this in some of the large uh, tax-exempt um, senior housing providers, but uh, you're gonna see this probably more in the, in the hospital space and certainly in some of the big not-for-profits in, in uh, universities and so forth. Um, it does exclude um, compensation paid to a licensed uh, medical professional. So to the extent that you've got a CEO who's also a physician and, and practicing, um, practicing medicine and performing medical services, that component of the compensation performing medical services would be excluded from this. Um, and this, this, is, uh, this analysis needs to be for all covered employees, which means uh, the five highest compensated employees for that tax year, which is a little bit different than what you report on your 990, which would include all your key plus all your top. Um, this would just be the top five. Um, and then obviously watch out for any kind of um, um, vesting uh, and severance payments paid out of a 457 plan uh, upon, on, upon termination and so forth. So we will see this come about. So the biggest, the, you know, the big changes here are going to be just more exposure to unrelated business income tax is going to be expected. And that's going to come through in a couple different areas. I touched on the disallowed fringe benefit expenses, um, transportation and so forth. That's considered unrelated business income now. Um, there's a concept now of called unrelated business activity bucketing, and I'll touch on that in the next slide. We talked a little bit about the changes to NOLs and uh, how that's going to, in fact, impact the bucketing of activities. Um, certainly, the change in rate uh, is favorable, coming down from 35% to 21 on unrelated business income. And also, what's favorable is the elimination of the, the AMT tax on the corporation side. So when we look a little closer again at the, the taxable income from fringe benefits. So as I mentioned previously, um, an exempt org includes in your UBTI any amount that you pay for qualified transportation fringe benefits, um, a parking facility, and, and on-site athletic facilities. Those would all be, all those expenses would be a UBI activity. And um, and to the extent that it's already part of a UBTI activity, you, would, you just wouldn't get the deduction. Um, and, so, and also, to the extent that you're a, a fiscal year taxpayer, 63018 year end, you're going to need to account for these fringe benefits um, um, in a split year manner. So prior to 123117 and after, they'll have to be accounted for separately. So with regards to activity bucketing, this is one of the bigger changes for tax exempt orgs in the in the law, and that is, you know, organizations that carry on more than one unrelated business activity 
um, you need to separately calculate your taxable income for each of those activities. So this would effectively prohibit using deductions from one activity to offset the income from another. So if you've got one UBI activity that's driving a loss, you couldn't apply that and net it together with your, you previously could net it together with your income activities. But now we've got to separately account for them um, and calculate them separately. Um, there is a transition rule, and I'll touch on in the next slide, that allows NOLs arising um, prior to 2018 uh, to be carried forward and not subject to this provision. So what's important is that this is effective for tax years, all tax years beginning after 1231-17. So here's an example of how it works. <coughs> Excuse me. In this example, we've got uh, four, five different acti unrelated business activities. So we look at the gross receipts and the expenses to come up with the net income by activity for each of these buckets. And so debt finance rental income, we have a loss. Web advertising, we've got income of 235,000. Tax at 21% would be $49,000 and so forth. So when you, you come over, add up all these, these activities and we have a total loss of $165,000. And under previous law, there we go. Under previous law, prior to 1231.17, we would be able to take that NOL of $165,000 and carry it forward and apply it up to 100% of our income on a go forward on a collective aggregate basis. Now, with tax years beginning after 1231.17, we have tax due of the 49,000, the 10,009, and the 10,005. We've got to pay that tax. We've got an NOL carry forward of 462,000 related specifically to the K-1 alternative investments that will carry forward and only apply to that same bucketed activity to 80% of the income. And also then a loss of 40,000 related to the debt finance rental income, which will again apply only to that activity in the future up to 80% of the income. One item to, to make note of here is to the extent that you are needing to determine uh, estimated tax payments for 2018 that you need to start looking at this, this type of UBI projection activity. I mentioned that the net operating loss deductions were modified and so prior to, I'm gonna show you three different rules here. Uh, prior to 1231.17, under the old rule, again, net operating losses were carried back two years, forward 20, offset 100% of our taxable income, and we didn't have to separately account for our activities. Under a transition rule, which is net operating losses ending after 1231.17, we don't carry it back. We have an indefinite carry forward, um, and we don't, we don't have to. These are fiscal years ending after 1231.17 that started prior to this. Um, we don't get to carry back, but we get to carry forward and we can offset 100% of taxable income and we don't have to worry about separately aggregating between the activities. However, fiscal years that begin after 1231.17, here's the new rule, is that again, no carry back, indefinite carry forward, limited to 80% of taxable income, but you have to apply it to each of the buckets uh, the separate activity buckets um, separately. Charitable giving, this is another big change uh, on the individual side that might have some implications to tax-exempt organizations. The, in, the standard deduction for individuals on their Schedule A for itemized deductions um, increased from 12,000 to 24,000. So the thought is, is there's estimates of 95% of taxpayers will now not itemize their deductions because the standard deduction doubled to 24,000, which many think will devalue the, um, the gifting that folks will be incentivized um, uh, to make charitable, charitable contributions. The other implication is the estate and gift tax exemption um, has doubled uh, as well starting in 18. 
it's indexed uh, for inflation. So right now it went from about six million, five and a half million, up to eleven million dollars of exemption, and so per per individual, so twenty two million for a couple. So a lot of folks um, are going to be transferring a lot of wealth uh, in the next five years, seven years or so, because this expires after 2025. And then a couple other small changes that, um, with regards to charitable contributions, is it repealed the deduction for athletic college athletic seating rights, as well as uh, it increased the AGI limit for contributions uh, to public charities from 50 to 60 percent of your adjusted gross income. One other last quick change with regards to exempt entities is tax exempt bonds. Uh, this the, the the tax exempt status for private activity bonds was retained. There was a, a lot of scuttle last year with regards to this uh, potentially being um, struck from the law, and, um, and uh, but that was that was not the case. Uh, the one item that did become um, uh, struck from the laws that is tax exemption for advanced refunding uh, bonds. So current refin refinancings of bonds is, uh, is obviously still okay as long as it's paid off within 90 days. Uh, it's just the advanced refundings that are um, have been repealed. And then the authority to issue tax credit bonds and direct pay bonds is repealed for those bonds issued after 1231.17. Okay, we've got a couple minutes left and we're gonna hit uh, some additional planning strategies for folks to consider. Um, we've talked about some of these items up above, but it's just a reminder, uh, to the extent that you're <clears throat> remodeling a facility, buying a facility, constructing a facility, there's a lot of opportunity with expensing provisions um, and leveraging high rate environment in 17 versus a lower rate environment in 18. <clears throat> it's a good opportunity. You can still make change in accounting methods for your fixed assets and do what we call look back studies and change and accelerate depreciation, change the lives of methods and so forth to accelerate depreciation into a high rate environment. There's the tangible property regulations. These have been around since 2014 where it provided a lot more uh, opportunity to expense as repair and maintenance as opposed to have to capitalize and depreciate. There's still opportunities to to, uh, to make those changes. Uh, energy incentives, a couple of them that are prominent in the long-term care space that we see were extended through 2017. That's the 179D energy building deduction, which provides for a $1.80 per square foot for certain energy efficiencies to the lighting, the HVAC, and the building envelope. Uh, there's code section 45L, which is an energy, and energy efficient credit that allows for up to $2,000 uh, of tax credit per dwelling unit. And then finally, the work opportunity tax credit, uh, which did not get changed. It's still in the law. It's generally something you want to consider if you've got at least 750 employees or so. And we are running short on time, so I'm going to keep going. The key takeaways for our for-profit entities, accelerating deductions into 2017, as Rob mentioned, or trying to defer income to 2018. Um, look at your tax methods, especially before you file your 2017 tax returns. Uh, pay attention to fixed asset planning, both that occurred uh, in 2017 and in 2018 budgeted, and then keep an eye on pass-through deductions if it applies to you and make sure that you're not being limited due to uh, wages or, or basis. Marcia, you want to get that last polling question in? Yeah, so for everyone to get their CPE, this is the final polling question we need you to answer. Uh, what tax planning strategies will your organization likely consider in the near term? Identifying potential qualifying business income for the 20% pass-through, entity restructuring, changing from accrual to cash method of accounting for tax, or cost seg segregation study? We'll give you a few more seconds to get an answer in there. Okay, looks like um, looking at potential qualifying business income for the pass-through and the cost segregation uh, study, closely followed by entity restructuring and a few people looking at accrual to cash. All right, we just have a couple slides to wrap this up. Um, first, if you're interested in any other Moss Adams webcasts, we do have some on-demand 
webcast out there right now if you want to look at more information about what's going on with the tax law changes. Um, these four we have out there on demand right now, and I'll show you the website you can go to if you're interested in any of these for some of the new tax law coverage. Um, the I went through that quickly, but it, the, where you can find them at is the mossadams.com slash tax reform. There's also a few other websites we have on here that have a lot more information out there regarding um, different pieces that, that these specific organizations think are important to point out about the tax reform resources. We do have a few Q&A questions that came through that we don't have time to answer today, but we will get back to those people that submitted those questions. Also, um, here is Rob and Todd's information if you would like to reach out to them specifically to get your questions answered. And I will turn it back to Emily to wrap us up. All right, thank you, Marcy. And thank you, Rob and Todd, for a great presentation today. We obviously covered a lot of material. And um, as Marcy said, if you have any questions, you can reach out directly to Rob or Todd, or you may still submit a question and we'll follow up with you after the webcast. Uh, as a reminder, if you attended today's presentation in a group and would like to receive CPE credit, you must complete the group attendance sheet found in the slide deck and handouts icon to the right of the slide view. If you participated as an individual and met all certification requirements, your certificate is available to download now in the CPE progress window to the right of the slide view. I'll keep the webcast console open for a few minutes to give you time to download your CPE certificate. A copy will be emailed within two weeks should you have any difficulty downloading it now. And here is a link to an online survey where you can provide feedback for today's presentation. Please take a moment to complete this survey as your feedback is very important to us. Thank you for joining us today and we hope you'll join us again next time. <laughs>